So moving towards the more, uh, in the health biotechnology chapter, today we are going to discuss about molecular diagnostics as the name title of the uh, lecture today already reflects. We are going to discuss how we can diagnose uh, different diseases through molecular methods. So whenever we talk about um, uh, diagnostics, it means detection of disease. If that particular disease is found in a particular organism, human beings, animals, or not. And when we talk about molecular, then we right away jump to the DNA level. And this is considered to be one of the most accurate kind of diagnostics. For example, if I compare it with the local, not local, but the conventional type of diagnostics of the past, if somebody has, let's suppose, malaria, so the simple test or the simple diagnostic analysis for finding out if that person has malaria or not is just, you take some blood out of his body and uh, spill it on or drop it on a glass slide with a cover slip and a bit of uh, oil emulsion uh, for a better refractive index. You view it or you image it under a light microscope and you can see if there is plasmodium falciparum in the blood or not. In this case, we are not talking about DNA or we're not talking about protein. We're just looking for the presence of a specific parasite inside the blood. Sometimes in uh, these kind of diagnostics or diagnostic tests, you can also stain. You can also provide certain dyes which will certain which will stain the particles. But when we talk about molecular diagnostics, we are going to go to the DNA level, and that's one of the most accurate diagnostics available these days. So molecular diagnostics are evolving, as I say, every day. These days, uh, nanoparticles are playing a major role in the diagnostics of uh, a number of diseases. And every few months, they evolve. A, a classical example that most of you, those who keep on reading news on uh, Facebook, Twitter, some of you might have LinkedIn, even with some, uh, some uh, t television channels, you would see that I can count at least five to 10 different diagnostic kits for the detection of uh, SARS coronavirus 2, which causes the diseases, which caused the disease COVID-19, the coronavirus, which has resulted in the lockdown all over the world. So it's rapidly evolving because every few weeks there's a new molecular detection, which and about the coronavirus detection, they are mostly either on the protein or the DNA. Mostly the viruses are like this. You cannot see them in a light microscope. You have to have uh, an electron microscope. And the goal is uh, to detect the pathogen or estimate the viral load. The viral load is very important. Viral load means the total titer of vi virus. In simple terms, it means the number of viral particles, the quantification of viral particles inside the body. This helps in the selection of a particular antiviral antibiotic. When you detect if it's a gram positive bacterium or it's a gram negative bacterium, you can devise an antibiotic and you can also find out which kind of bacterium it is, but for which spectrum of antibiotics it is none to resist and which uh, antibiotics it is none to be susceptible. Similarly, antiviral. And the most important one, which is connected with viral loads, how much dosage, how much is the viral so that you can kill. Whenever you go in a war, you take in concentration how much is the number of the enemy 
So here the enemy is represented by viruses and we have to tackle virus as per their number. The more, the more the virus particles, the more the higher the dosage we need. Similarly, diagnosis of cancer and many other diseases like HIV, sickle cell anemia. And also by local diagnostic can also pave the way in prognosis. So prognostic assessment means you can do through genetic testing, you can find out if a person, he or she will be prone to develop a certain disease at a certain age or not. And then when you notice that you are on the verge or you are um, technically at risk, you can take the measures and hopefully avoid the onset of the disease. Or if not, then you can delay it or slow it down in, in a number of cases. It's a nice molecular diagnostic uh, schematic. So you can use it in health sector, medicine sector. Forensics is very important. Uh, for example, you might, you, most, most of you have known about some science fiction series in which uh, anything, saliva, blood, sper uh, sperm, semen, hair, and you can do, you can have the DNA extracted from that samples and through the DNA polymorphism, you can find out the person you can reach to him. That's just one example. Any, a lot of more examples can be used in forensics. The pharmaceutical industry in biological warfare or actually detection of biological warfare. If a biological warfare, uh, you are under biological warfare, how would you know which kind of organism it is? So then you can just use molecular diagnostic for that purposes and for drug discovery also. The approaches are like you can use PCR, you can use peptide nucleic acid, you can use proteomics, biochips, biosensors, using nanoparticles or some other uh, latest inventions of nanotechnology. Spectroscopy, you can also detect a number of uh, protein analysis through mass spectroscopy, uh, the detection of DNA and fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is also known as FISH. So today we will concentrate, we will explain molecular diagnostics in terms of um, health and medicine, I would say. And we will be talking about fish, fluorescence in situ hybridization for the detection of breast cancer. And then we will be talking about PCR based technology for detection of SARS coronavirus 2. Why did I select SARS coronavirus 2? Because it is the hot topic of today and everyone who is a science person should know about it. As a science student, you should know how this process works. Uh, the toolkit for diagnosis, the molecular diagnosis toolkit are always, almost always follow three processes, the extraction or the collection of the sample, the amplification of the sample, and then finally the detection of the sample, what it is. In between the extraction and amplification, there are very important steps so that when you carefully harvested the sample, it should not be destroyed by the environmental conditions and during the transport. So this is very critical. And then when you amplify and detect it, here you have to be careful to avoid false, some, um, false positive signals. So in between, there are crucial steps also are present. The samples are either DNA or the RNA or the protein. It could be harvested from either whole from the blood, from the sera, from plasma, blood clot, from a buccal cavity, buccal cells, cultured cells, urine, feces, cerebrospinal fluid. And these vitals could be archival tissues, could be fresh frozen. So a number of possibilities exist. Similarly, the target amplification, you can use PCR, you can use RT-PCR, both of them are actually PCR, so you have polymerase chain reaction, the in vitro amplification of uh, DNA, the isothermal, Assays. You can also use ligase chain reactions. I do not need to explain this. Single amplification, branch uh, DNA assay, and proximity ligation assay. These are all different type of amplification assay, which will amplify the amount, the number, the quantity, or the signals of the samples. And then uh, detection could be through electrophoresis, conventional, old uh, style, still very, very powerful and very 
useful. You can also go for direct sequencing of the protein or direct sequencing of the DNA hybridization. You can hybridize it with other proteins, with other molecules, with other antibodies. Real-time fluorescence you can detect the fluorescence in the real time as it's happening. Belt curve again, fluorescence and in situ hybridization. In all these ELISA, in all these, there is fluorescence involved. And MS is mass spectroscopy through which you can determine uh, through the molecular weights of the protein or, or molecular weights of the compounds. Okay, so now we start with the molecular diagnostics of cancer. The first step in uh, diagnostic a cancer on molecular level is the collection of the sample. So you have to collect the tissue sample, the specimen for testing, and uh, there are different methods to which you can have these samples collected. And it depends on the purpose of the testing, the type of the testing, as well as the type of tissues involved. You could also take direct blood cells. You can have a scrap of a tissue, saliva, skin, a number of possibilities possible. And uh, this is what I explained here, that in between there are very crucial and uh, very important steps. So you cannot uh, start the molecular diagnostics right away because when you collect the sample from hospitals or, or some health clinics or even random uh, locations, you cannot just right away start the diagnostic test. So you have to bring samples to your lab and they have to be processed in a proper way so that you could reach a final detection goals. And this is why we have to keep the sample safe and in a surviving condition, otherwise we will lose the sample. So a number of methods exist. For example, you can, you can uh, treat it with the chemicals like formalin and embed it in simple wax. So this would keep the sample safe for a few hours. Another method is to actually snap freeze it using uh, lipid nitrogen or other chemicals, which we keep the sample at minus 80 degree. Again, the type of the tissue, the type of methods and storage all can influence the viability of the sample. So as long as the sample is viable, it will be good enough for molecular testing. Then when, if you snap frozen at minus 80 degrees centigrade, the DNA and protein can survive and remain viable for a large number of years. RNA, however, may survive for like three to five years maximum. Okay, fish. So the abbreviation of fish is fluorescence in situ hybridization. And fish is a technique uh, that documents the location of a genetic material, and it also includes DNA in genes. Uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization actually is a molecular cytogenetic technique which uses probes, but these probes, what are these probes? These probes are DNA probes, and not only their DNA probes, but they are also fluorescently tagged, which will bind, and these tags will bind only to those parts of the nucleic acid or the DNA where it has almost a complete degree of sequence similarity. So wherever it has a sequence similarity, it will bind only there. This uh, uh, technique was actually developed quite a few years ago in the early 1980s. And uh, the, um, the goal for which it was detected was to localize the presence or the absence of specific DNA sequences on chromosomes. And uh, fluorescence microscopy is used to find out the fluorescent probe is bound to uh, the chromosomes or not. In this image, you can see this is the DNA. This is this this hook is the probe, and this worm is actually the fluorescence tag. So the sample, the fluorescence tag, and the probe. And a good thing about in situ uh, fish process in situ hybridization is that it is very commonly used in the detection of HER2 breast cancer. HER2 is a type of breast cancer. Uh, 
which is very common in Pakistan these days. After mouth cancers, it's on the second, it's the second uh, most prevalent cancer in Pakistan. Uh, this is how fish works. So this is this represents a chromosome. You have a chromosome. You detect. You, you have a chromosome, and then you purify the DNA from the chromosome. And you can see this is the DNA of uh, the target. Let's say my DNA, or let's say someone else's DNA. And these two guys with these purple dots, these are the probes. So this is not a part of the natural DNA. These are the probes. So you harvest the DNA, and then you open the double strand, just like in case of southern blotting, you would denature the DNA so that the DNA are no longer as a double stranded, but they exist as single stranded. Then when the DNA is single stranded, you would introduce, you would introduce the labeled, the probe labeled, the fluorescently tagged micro um, pieces of DNA, and you would incubate them. Once you have enough time, uh, incubation where these probes have subsequent similarity they would go they would attach and after subsequent washing step you have to have a washing step so that the unbound dna could be washed away you can check it under a fluorescent microscope and if you see fluorescence coming out from different regions it would mean a positive result a positive sample this is another a rather simple uh, representation of fish technique. So this is the DNA upon heating or upon some chemical treatment like uh, alkalis, sodium hydroxide, you would denature it. After denaturing it, you would incubate it with the probe that is fluorescent labeled. And now the point, the key point to understand here when we design these probes, we already have the information about the genes mutation. Now, in HER2, what happens? There's a gene that is mutated in the breast cells. And we already know the mutation, that the mutation has this particular sequence. And if we want to see if that particular sequence is present in a particular human being in his in her cells we design a single stranded complementary sequence and tag it with a fluorescent dye so when let's suppose this person this female has had to breast cancer it would mean that there is mutation in the genes and we would know the exact we already know the exact mutation so based on that mutation, we have designed these five to 10 nucleotides long probes with fluorescent dyes tagged. And if the mutation is there, this tag will bind. And when we see it in a fluorescent microscope, we will see fluorescence. But if the mutation is not there, this tag will not bind because it will not have it will not find its sequence complementarity and when we do the washing step all the fluorescent tagged probes will wash away and we will have just blank dna we will see no fluorescence in the fluorescence microscopy this is uh, how fish experiments look like in a, a real lab so you could see here there are very little fluorescence or no fluorescence, which represents negative samples. Here, you could see two different types of probes are used, the red one and the green one, the red one and the green one. There are some hits, again, again, some hits, but here I just see only one hit. So if we ignore this guy and this guy, like these are all negative samples because there is no hit. Now let's concentrate more on a positive sample. But this is a HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, the detail written here is a bit above your level because this is quantified. So we say if a two plus immunostaining scores were identified, forget about that at the moment, just concentrate on these uh, fluorescent, which means 
when the DNA was isolated and it was made single-stranded and these probes were allowed to incubate and bind to these HER2 genes, after washing, they still are there in, this, in these tissues, which means it's a positive sample. There are HER2 cancer cell uh, in these cells. This is how it would look. And it's a very fast technique and it's a very accurate technique and it's very popular for the diagnosis of cancers and a number of other diseases. Uh, next, we will discuss about a viral disease, SARS coronavirus 2. In the next slide, we will see it. How can we do that?